And to uh, the panel, thanks for what you do, not only on this particular issue, but your service to our country. Uh, we appreciate you very much. It's pretty obvious that uh, based on the questions being asked, there's a real issue regarding not just missile defense, but the comments that have been made by the Russians. And as Senator McCain said, they've been so strong and so direct. Um, I don't know whether there's been any challenge to that. Uh, on the part of the administration to the president, um, um, Madad Bev, but uh, certainly he's going to be here, as you say, next week. He's going to be meeting with the president. He'll also be meeting with um, uh, some members on the Hill, so there'll be an opportunity to clarify this. I hope the president challenges him on it, uh, because it is a key issue with respect to where we go. And with that in mind, uh, to uh, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Gates, I want to focus on what I see as a relevant decision points with respect to missile defense and what factors the U.S. will consider when making decisions. And first of all, some of my colleagues have stated that in the overall context of U.S. national security, the issue of missile defense may be more important than any agreement that the U.S. and Russia enter into regarding nuclear weapons. And that's because we're much less likely, as both Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates have alluded to today, to face a nuclear conflict with the Russians than we are to be attacked or threatened by a rogue nation or terrorist group that possesses nuclear weapons. I agree with that perspective, and that's why we need a robust missile defense system not to protect us from the Russians but to protect us from primarily a rogue nation. And Secretary Gates, I, I think you even spoke to this issue directly in previous testimony. Now to my question, in the 2020 time frame, the United States is currently planning to deploy the SM-3 Block 2B missile in Europe, and although it is intended to defend against launches from the Middle East, the missile will have an ICBM intercept capability and could represent, under this treaty, from the Russian perspective, a qualitative or quantitative improvement in U.S. missile defenses that could provoke a Russian withdrawal from the treaty. Assuming the threat to the U.S. and our European allies still warrants deploying the SM-3 uh, uh, Block 2 uh, B missile around the 2020 fr uh, time frame, and assuming that you were in your current position when that decision needed to be made, would you recommend the United States deploy this system regardless of the Russian response? Yes, sir, I would. I think that um, the, the kind of missile threat that we face from uh, rogue states such as Iran and, uh, and North Korea is, is such a problem, and I think by 2020 we may well see it uh, from other states, especially if we're unsuccessful in, in uh, stopping Iran from building nuclear weapons. I think you'll see proliferation in the, in the Middle East of nuclear weapons and probably missiles. So I think that, that, the, that the need will, will be even, even greater, perhaps, by that time. So, um, you know, fast forwarding 10 years. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the plan that we have laid out and the developments that we've laid out <clears throat> as part of the phased adaptive array, plus keeping the ground-based interceptors in Alaska and Vandenberg and continuing to upgrade those for the longer-range missiles uh, would be absolutely essential. And I would say there's one other reason why I think we would need to do this, and that is because <clears throat> one, of the, one of the elements of the intelligence that uh, contributed to the decision on the phased adaptive array was the realization that if Iran were actually to launch a missile attack on Europe, it wouldn't be just a one or two missiles uh, or a handful. It would more likely be a salvo kind of attack where you would be dealing potentially with scores or even hundreds of missiles. And so the kind of capability that we're talking about with the SM-3 Block 2B uh, would give us the ability to protect our troops, our bases, our facilities, and our allies in Europe. So for, the, for all those reasons, uh, that, that would be my recommendation, if, God forbid, I were still in this job 10 years from now. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, you didn't think you would be there now, so who knows? Uh, Secretary Clinton, I assume you concur with that. Uh, yes, I do, Senator, completely. Thank you. Well, with the God forbid part of it. <laughs> the whole thing, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> 
Well, frankly, that's, um, uh, that makes it much more comforting. I assume that that was the case, Mr. Secretary, but um, uh, it is a much more comforting to us. Uh, I'm God, my time is up, so I don't have time to get into the um, issue of rail mobile launched uh, weapons, which this treaty is silent on. We know the Russians have a history of that, and as I read the treaty, um, those would be exempt, would not be counted, and that could be a serious issue for a number of us. And I'll submit a question for the record to you relative to um, uh, to um, rail as well as sea and air launched ICBMs. But lastly, just a comment, with the complexity of this issue and the obvious um, uh, determination on the part of the administration as, as it has been expressed by each of you today, uh, I don't know whether you've given any thought to doing a red team on this, but with all the complexities and the difficulties on this side, I would hope maybe you'd give some thought to um, having a red team look at this so that we can be better prepared to move as quickly as what you folks obviously want us to move. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Senator Burris. Thank you.